Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Bringing Government to You. My name is Kevin Dumas. I'm the town manager here in Mansfield. And today on the show, we have Sean Burke with us. Sean, welcome. Thank you, Kevin. Good, good morning. <laughs> good morning. It's good to have you here. And uh, Sean is our, our town planner, and uh, he has uh, many, many, many responsibilities. Um, here today, we're to talk a, a little bit about what Sean does for the town, and eventually getting into our master plan and why that's important here in town. But if we revert back in time to when you first started, it was just uh, about three decades ago, just a little bit over that, oh 1989, my. right? That's correct. Yeah, I started in March of 89. Things were very, very busy at that time. And let's talk about that, because I think that the certainly the town of Mansfield looked very different back at that time to where we are today in 2019. Absolutely. In, in uh, the late 80s, there was a tremendous building boom. Uh, when I first started, there were 35, if you can imagine, 35 active subdivisions. Wow. Hundreds of houses all over in various states of construction, school, pop school age children, the population was just exploding in Mansfield. Um, I was at the second or third year I was here at town meeting. We accepted 42 streets wow. as new public ways in town. A tremendous new burden on the Department of Public Works. Of course. As the result of, of rapid growth. Um, if I went back beyond 89 when I was in graduate school, I uh, wrote my thesis on open space and recreation planning. And one of the resources that I used was a pre-publication version of Losing Ground by um, Mass Autobahn. And it cited Mansfield in that pre-publication version as the community in Massachusetts that was losing open space most rapidly of all the 351 cities and towns. Wow. Mansfield was losing open space most rapidly. It was kind of it was kismet that years later, and it was 83. That in 89 I came to work for the town, and as I said, there were 35 active subdivisions. Incredible. It was just. The rate of development was, I don't want to say hectic, it was beyond hectic. Now, was that both in West Mansfield and East Mansfield? East no? Mansfield. Okay. In 1990 alone, one developer built 100 houses out in East Mansfield. Wow. And that was, it was just absolutely amazing to see the school department try to grapple with all those new students, to see the Department of Public Works trying to plow all those new streets. It was, um, it was a very difficult situation. The master plan that we adopted at that time, that comprehensive plan in October of 89 that was adopted, was adopted overwhelmingly. And that was a, a plan that tried to manage that growth, that dealt with land use issues, that dealt with land use management, that dealt with infrastructure and facilities. And that was the focus at that time, how to deal with that, how, to, how do you try to manage that type of growth. It was like the Wild West, and it really was. Let's talk about population change, because when you first came, the population was much less in Mansfield than what it is today. It was. It was significantly less. It was somewhere around 14,000 people. And commuter rail, while it was very popular, certainly wasn't, didn't have the demand that it had. It was an issue of right. where do we park all the commuters. Right. But if you look at the demand for commuter parking today, it's far in excess of what it was then. Sure. And one of the, the scariest things, if I can label it that way, was the idea that there was a plan on the table 
to build a commuter rail station out where Mansfield, across the street from Mansfield Crossing. Oh, that's right. With that's a flyover from 495 that um, would be a regional station, straighten out School Street, and have where Mansfield Crossing is be an extension of Cabot Business Park, a hotel convention center, million square feet of R&D space. Wow. As well as um, a massive concrete parking garage with, if I recall a number, somewhere between 2,000 or, or more spaces wow. in that location. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, if you recall also, the economy tanked in the early 90s. Um, and banks went down, developers went down, the market for commercial and industrial space out on the 495 belt evaporated, right. as did that plan for the uh, giant parking garage and straightening out uh, School Street and um, a million square feet of office and R&D and hotel space. And that land sat idle for another 20 years. Unbelievable. And now look at what's there now. It is. Right? Um, it, it's you know, rule of thumb is that retail follows residential, and we had 20 years of residential development. That grew the population by an additional, about 10,000, right? Exactly. About 24,000 today. Exactly. We're up at 24,000, almost 25,000 people today, and all that pent-up residential demand resulted in a couple of things. We had Stop and Shop, we had Shaw's, and we weren't exporting all those food dollars to Easton or Plainville or North Attleboro, but those food dollars were now being spent here in town. And that's a good thing because now we had local vendors servicing the, the grocery stores. We had local employment at the grocery stores and we had competition between the grocery stores. So the local residents benefited from convenience, they benefited from competition, they benefited from employment opportunity, and the local vendors also. The spin-off of that obviously was now the, the people had uh, to buy fuel someplace, so the vendors were buying fuel locally, so there's a, a secondary and tertiary effect of having supermarkets. So it was, whether you like retail or not, people have to eat. So the, the supermarkets were a uh, perhaps an unintended consequence of the rapid residential development, as was Mansfield Crossing. There was no longer that market for a second Capit Business Park, right. but there certainly was pent up demand for retail space of a nature other than downtown type of um, specialty stores and specialty shops that a traditional downtown has. Right. So we had the big box retailers come in at um, Mansfield Crossing, then you had the spin off across the street from Mansfield Crossing filling that, what, what one of our consultants called when we did our second master plan, the Golden Triangle. That area between 140, 495, and um, the commuter rail line south of Cabot Business Park. Right. So it's been interesting watching that happen, that dynamic. Well, when you talk about the residential development as a result of that incredible demand that that creates for services, how the town then puts together a plan in order to be able to make sure that you're meeting all the needs. So you talked about what was happening, the stresses on the school system, 
and stresses on DPW plowing. Never mind public safety, providing rescue service and everything else that we provide in services to our residents here in town. That changes the character, it changes the dynamic, and how do we look at those things? And that's really through the comprehensive master plan process. So if you want to talk a little bit about that, what is the process in Massachusetts that we have here to do that? And then as a result, how do we build the plan? And then how do we help execute the plan? Uh, all very good questions, Mr. Dumas. Well, the plan itself is, while not required by the Commonwealth, certainly is recommended by the Commonwealth. And the Commonwealth recommends that that a comprehensive plan be done every 10 years, be updated every 10 years, in order for grant funding. So there's the kind of carrot and stick approach. Sure. That if you have a current master plan, when you file for competitive grants, you go to the top of the list. If you don't have a current master plan, you go to the bottom of the list. So you get bonus points on your grant applications, and that's the carrot. So you want to keep a current master plan for grant applications. The other thing is, it's the framework for decision making. That's what I always tell people. I say, well, why do you do that? Well, it's the fundamental foundation for your capital plan, for your zoning bylaw, for your subdivision regulations, and it also, as part of, of the things that you do in the plan, the seven basic tenants, it looks at your infrastructure. You're looking at population, you're looking at open space and, and recreation, you're looking at infrastructure, you're looking at economic development, you're looking at the physical characteristics, the land use characteristics of the community. You're looking at it comprehensively and what you're doing is you're pulling in the people to set goals. The most important thing is, is what do you want your town to be? So you're setting this horizon and saying, in the short term, what, can, what do you want us to do and what can we do better? So you go back and you look at what you've done and you say, what are your accomplishments? Okay, what haven't you accomplished? What do you carry forward? And what do you want us to do? What do you want? Do you want a green community? Do you want things like the Jordan Jackson School to be built? That's your infrastructure. Right. And that's exactly what happened. That became part of the capital plan. The, the municipal complex. The I municipal complex, is right. a, that was part of the capital plan. That was planned for and built. The Department of Public Works building, that whole complex. You have the water building out back, you have the Department of Public Works, you have the shared public safety facility. That was all part of a capital plan that said we need to improve our infrastructure. And that was supported in the last capital, in the last comprehensive plan. It was articulated in the capital plan and it was supported by the voters at town meeting. So these weren't random pinball activities. These were all structured activities that have been planned out over the past 10 years. And I think that when you look back at all the planning activities that we've conducted, whether it was the strategy sessions and strategic sessions in 2012 and 15 with Dr. Mullen, or it was updating this, the master plan, the 1955-54 master plan um, that was done in 89, we updated that one. Um, it's always involved community, the community involvement, the charrette. Um, I, I still remember the, uh, if your town was a color, what color would it be? If your town was an automobile, what kind of automobile would it be? And it's that visioning session. What do you want your town to be? And what you see out there right now is a function of the community involvement because the comprehensive plan is the will of the community. Our zoning is what those visioning sessions have decided they want the future of the town to be 
You want a vibrant community. You want a safe community. You want public safety to be at the, at the forefront of events, that you want rapid response from the fire department. You want rapid response from the police department. You want nicely maintained roads, which is why the Department of Public Works has their $2 million road bond because you want well taken care of streets. All of these things have been articulated during our visioning sessions. That's right. So it's important that we maintain those sessions and public involvement. And how does that typically work, Sean? Well, what we do, we, the planning board, spearheads this event by reaching out and saying, as we're going to be doing in September, that we are having certain events take place on certain nights. We advertise on the website, we'll put something in the paper, we will invite people in and we'll say we're going to be doing the open space and recreation plan. If that's what your interest is in, please come and attend this session and discuss these things with us. We're going to be talking about infrastructure, we are going to be talking about um, the transit oriented development. Over the commuter rail, right? Over by the commuter rail station. Mm -hmm. Come to that session. Talk to us about your experience with commuter rail. Talk to us about what you see as the future for that undeveloped land. What would you like to see there? What kind of um, services, retail, medical office buildings, would you like to see there? What's, what kind of density, height? What would you like to see the buildings look like? What, what types of links would you like to see between that area and the traditional downtown? And by links, I mean pedestrian links, bicycle links, um, business links, internet, all those types of things. Um, that pull downtown together. How can we take that that undeveloped area and pull it into downtown so downtown is a unified whole? What are your ideas? Because we want them. That's what master plan and a comprehensive plan is all about. What are the community ideas? You don't want to know what my ideas are. I want to know what your ideas are. And I think that's a good point because the community involvement piece is critical to the outcome of the process. And so, you know, in addition, we'll be thinking of other ways to reach out to people, but I think certainly cable access here is a great tool. Well, we're going to talk about this today and let people know, hey, this is coming this fall. We're going to want your involvement. And whether it's we're reaching out via our kids to the school system or reaching out in other ways to the council on aging and the library population, how can we continue to do that? Because this is your town. This is our vision and how then we collectively, as the town leaders, come together in our departments, how do we make all this happen? You know, certainly with the guidance and the visioning of the select board and with the finance committee as well, and to lift this and make this a reality. And I, and I think it's, it's incredible that in just some of the little strategic meetings that we've had thus far, when you can show, because you track all the progress that we're making, and you look at what it was 10 years ago, and I would say there's probably 80% of those items have actually been complete, which is pretty unheard of to see that much progress happen over a relatively short period of time. But that also goes toward you and all the other departments working so hard together in order to make a lot of these things come to reality. So I thank you for that. Well, you're welcome. Thank you. That's my job. I get paid a lot of money to do it. But I think you're right in that the all the departments work together. We've had tremendous support from the finance committee, from the select board, from the planning board. Um, if we can't get the policy makers to implement and stick to the policies that are articulated in the plan, then we can't go anywhere. We need That's the right. leadership. That's right. We need the leadership to adopt the plan, to look at the plan and say, we agree, let's go in this direction. And then we, staff can support those policies, we can implement those policies, and we can all move forward in the same, the same direction. 
I think what's different about this time is when we talked about in the past, we talked about land use, we talked about managing land use, we talked about actually slowing the rate of development, things of that nature. Um, this time around, I think my sense is that economic development, managing the Cabot Park, managing downtown, managing TOD, to revitalize to, um, and I'm thinking of our, our other business park also, that um, we've really got to look at those, those assets and say, what can we do as a community to keep adding value, to keep bringing in new businesses, to keep encouraging reinvestment and investment in the existing businesses to make them grow, to add value. So the tax burden isn't borne solely by the residential taxpayers, but is spread over the Cabot Business Park and some of the transit-oriented development area. And um, why am I spacing on the name of the, our other business park, yeah, Ryan park. Elliott Industrial Park, that when we reinvest in those areas and we have reinvestment in those areas, that economic development is a major part of this new comprehensive plan. Absolutely. It's the vitality of, of the dollars that are infused into the budgetary process that help us engage and to be able to do this on our own. So instead of having to ask for a series of additional debt exclusions, the more that we're successful in the reinvestment in new tax growth that happens in town, that helps alleviate that burden, which is really important. Um, and you've done that in a myriad of ways. You know, Some of the zoning changes that you've enacted and the town meeting approved for the Cabot Industrial Business Park, uh, last town meeting, the changes that were made up north and the uh, Raya Elliott Industrial Park area um, for a certain space to be able to allow for additional uses, um, how we look at redevelopment, reinvestment, the chocolate factory. I mean, look what that's going to turn into. These are all things that are initiated by implementing the policies and the things that are allowed by zoning. Right, and I, th I, I think that's, that's important to, to think about. When you mentioned the chocolate factory, that's a $32 million rehab going into Huge. that building. And that's such an integral part of Mansfield's history. Absolutely. To be able to preserve that building, to be able to see it flourish again, I think is, it's, it's important to maintain that link to the past, to be able to preserve your history. That's what makes it a community and not just a, a bunch of houses around the train tracks. Right. And that's important. That's, that's so important to main, maintain the link to the past while keeping an eye on your future. And that's what we try to do. I think the interesting part too is while we listen to the public and we engage them for ideas, um, it's also important for the public to realize it's very important for communities while we realize history with infusions of people, dollars, transportation, town can change. And it's how we manage that change, because if we ever stop changing, if we ever stop amending, even though it could be small, it doesn't have to be major, the community can't grow. Well, and I think that that's an interesting play because sometimes I think we struggle with, oh, I don't want any change. And it's difficult because we have to allow for some change to accommodate the needs of housing. What's happening of the housing needs, particularly in Massachusetts, New England in general, but particularly in Massachusetts, with so many of the baby boomers retiring, staying here, there are so many new jobs, and we can't create enough housing in the different types of housing that are needed for all of our new younger people to be able to support the jobs. So it's a, it's a huge challenge of what we're looking about. A, we're dealing with aging in place, which is a whole nother, which I'm sure is gonna be part of this plan that we're talking about and the needs of our uh, older adult population. But it's also the fact, how do we create the housing that we need to support all the young people who are trying to take these jobs, not just in Boston and Providence, but everywhere else up down 495 and also here in town? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's the maximum of planning is 
there is nothing so constant as change. Right. I mean, that's, that goes way back to one of the early Greek philosophers. And I think when you, you talk about a population aging, Mansfield at one point was the youngest community in the Commonwealth. That's no longer true. And when you talk about housing demand, there's a tremendous demand for housing, age-restricted housing, 55 and over, right. because people are aging in place. That it's, it's no longer the rush to move to the uh, southwest or the southeast. That many people want to be near their families and stay in the community that they grew up in or worked in. And that's one of the changes that we've seen here is that mm -hmm. demand for housing for older folks, folks my age, who don't want to go to Arizona, who don't want to go to North Carolina, who don't want to go to Florida, but really want to stay here near their grandchildren. So we have seen a lot of change. And I, I don't think we want change for change's sake. But we have to realize that change is, to some extent, inevitable. And our job is to manage change in a positive direction. Exactly. It's not to block change. It's to manage change. And that's important. That's a, that's a key thing is that when we identify these goals, is we want to guide that change to meet the goals, to reach the goals, to meet those milestones that we set in the plan. It's an exciting time, for sure. I'm Absolutely. glad we're embarking off on it. If we look at the time frame, um, typically we're looking at September for a lot of the groups to start their work. Right. And typically what will happen after that time frame? Well, we'll, we'll look at a, uh, a planning sure at some point in late October. Okay. And then we will look for a series of meetings over the winter and wrap this up in April where we will have um, a completion, a final draft of the plan by April for a presentation at town meeting in May. Beautiful. And, and, and again, the public will be notified as we make our way through. We want to hear from them. We Absolutely. need their input. And that's going to be one of the, the biggest stressors that I hope that people hear out of today with us. It's, it's their town. It's their plan. And we need their input to help be the guiding force that's to exactly set these right. goals. So, well said. Absolutely. And again, Sean, thank you for you know, your guidance, and I've, I've grown to really depend on you heavily for all the discussions, whether it's economic development related or whether it's something going on with planning board or, or interpretations with Bob Blackman on zoning, our building commissioner, and to see uh, your vast knowledge uh, in your history that you've had here in Mansfield for over three decades is really, truly amazing. I don't think that many planners go through something where all of the attributes of what you actually learned and through your degree program have happened literally here and have touched every aspect. I mean, we're talking from sewer, then regional sewer, all of our water systems, the, how fortunate we are with the municipal airport, municipal managed electricity with Mansfield Electric, to the change in our school system for infrastructure improvements and roadway systems, redesign, complete streets. I mean, we can go on and on and thinking, and what's happened in the Cabot Park alone, I mean, we talked about this year just from January to May, you know, additional reinvestment of almost $7.4 million in five months. There's so much going on. It, it's, it's amazing. Really it's absolutely amazing. Not a lot of people have that opportunity for a career like yours to see yeah, something happen yeah. like that. Um, and you've, you've been a guiding force in that. And I, and I thank you, and I certainly thank the planning board for their yeah. input. And... Uh, and we certainly couldn't do it without you and your team. So, thank you. And we have to mention Jennifer Davis too. So, absolutely, <laughs> Jennifer is invaluable. She really is. So, hopefully, our viewers today got to be able to learn a little bit about Sean and his planning department and what the planning board does. How they're really engaged so much through this open participatory process of the update of the town's comprehensive master plan, and really how important it is, and that we're going to be needing your help. So. Over the coming months, as we make our way, you know, August is coming this week. I can't believe it. Um, but we'll be making our way into September, and you'll be seeing this process come alive. And we ask that you pay attention. So if you see things here on cable access, you're going to be seeing things in the newspaper, on the town's website, um, some other direct mailing that we're going to be considering doing to people as well. 
We want your input. We want you to be with us through this process as this is your town and this is your government and your plan that we need to be able to bring to life over the next 10 years in Mansfield. So again, thank you for tuning in and gov bringing government to you. Kevin Dumas, your town manager, and it's been a pleasure. And until next time, thank you.